Hello, and welcome to Lois Wagner Fine Art. I'm Timothy Clark, and I'll be your host for this short section looking at the masterpieces in Lois's gallery here in New York City, just as this bicycle is rolling along and starting to go places. So are we as a country and as a world where, where after a year of sequestering, we're now uh, kind of getting outside, getting some sunshine and moving on. We're gonna look at some of these great pieces we're going to talk about the love of art, and thank you, Lois, for asking me to do this. Uh, welcome back, all of you, to Lois Wagner Galleries. We're right across the street from the Frick. The Frick is closed at this location, but Lois is open and welcomes anyone who loves art, and we hope that's you. Very often when people go to galleries, they begin to find what they like, what just appeals to them, but sometimes it helps to get an understanding on how, those, how that art happened, what the history of it was, and how it evolved. And if you can understand a little bit more about how paintings are created and how things have changed over the years, it makes one become a connoisseur instead of just someone who says they like art. They're both good, but uh, today we're going to take a look at how travel changed American art, how the inspiration of foreign lands when Americans were able to move leisurely, and they still do, uh, how combining cultures made American painting really what it is. As, as we look at American painters who travel, today would be, we'll have a little fun looking at Whistler. Now we all know Whistler's mother, and we know the painting, we're f quite familiar with it, but also Whistler had a tendency to paint sometimes grand subject matters, but he also liked very intimate subject matters. Sometimes he painted, or in this case, made an etching of a little bridge right near his house little Putney, and it's just a glorious little painting. But he believed in crossing cultures. The, the real name of, of uh, Whistler's mother is studying gray and black, number one. Most people would, they all think of it as Whistler's mother, but that's just the common name. He, he made a, a comparison to a musical movement. Uh, he called his little little evening paintings, nocturnes, after a musical nocturne move. As we put up this Japanese print, this is one of the great inspirations for Whistler were the Japanese block prints, because instead of rendering with soft edges like a Renaissance painting, he has clear cut edges on everything and he, it celebrates the shape of all things. And so we see these Japanese prints and we see its influence on Whistler and it, it changes the whole movement. And so we're gonna take a peek at how he changed art by changing culture. Sometimes he even got so mad at some of his best friends because they weren't moving along, he dropped them. He, there were, you'd think all artists was one big happy family. It, it, it wasn't then, maybe it never was. And uh, in Whistler, they, there was even a, uh, a book that he wrote, something about the gentle art of making enemies. So we'll, we'll look at how he made friends and enemies and did all kinds of great things as he traveled. When most artists went to Venice to paint, they spent all their time here in uh, Piazza San Marco. If we look at all of Venice, it, it covers a great area, but so many pieces came from there because they knew they could look across to San Giorgio, to Santa Maria della Salute, and see all of the great, great monumental piece, places around here. They became cliches and there's still cliches. People know that they can do these paintings. Even amateurs can go there and people want those pieces today. But 150 years ago, the sophisticated collectors wanted 
other things. They wanted original art. So Whistler had an economic downturn. He had some support from Fine Art Society in London, and they paid him to go over here, to go over to Venice, but he went to this area called Canarigio, which had, had, around the Church of the San Apostoli, looking out in other directions, just areas that no one had really painted. He had to to make up a new language to paint these. Some of the other things were almost like being a Beatles cover band. They were, they were the old standards populars everybody was, was familiar with. And when he lived there, he had, um, Americans knew that he was there and so they began to go there. There was a great Cincinnati-born artist named Frank Duvenac and Frank Duvenac had his followers, they all would go there and, and Whistler would say, who is broke, but he'd say, I'll, bring, I'll make breakfast for you. But he'd borrow money for them to buy eggs to be able to make that. And they all looked at these original compositions and they copied them. They, uh, when he, he went back, he said he had all original compositions and the critics said, oh no, we saw these six months ago from the Duvenac students. but. One of the most important Duvenac students that that uh, was that came through was a man named Robert Bloom, and Robert Bloom has a wonderful portrait right here in Lois's gallery, and we'll take a look at it right now. It's just a beautiful piece that he painted of Hyla Lloyd Drake in a Japanese costume. He had also gone to Japan, so this influence that we talked about with the flat shapes that we see in Whistler's painting, we see uh, we see Robert Bloom um, putting those so clearly as he paints this woman in a Japanese costume, and he paints it with flat, simple shapes. It's, it's really is a combination of chiaroscuro, which comes to us from the Renaissance, really, from Leonardo, and and he's merged it with the Japanese flat shapes. It's a, it's a beautiful merging of cultures that come out with a brand new thing. Whistler was really the leader here. Now, there's a wonderful Whistler painting called Le Robe Rouge, which we'll also look at right here in Lois's gallery. It's here. Come here and look at it. It's a, a glorious uh, etching that, that just shows how he had a, a love of the human form, especially the female human form. She sits there in this beautiful beautiful room. And if we look very, very closely right here, we can see the little butterfly that he paints, which is his trademark signature. So Whistler's influence grew like a rock in a puddle in a, in a pond. Uh, the ripples went everywhere. So we're going to look at John Sloan, who didn't travel that much, but those influences came through. He looked at the um, uh, back alleys of New York City and he painted, oh, how would I put it, the, the common life. He painted McSorley's Bar and all kinds of wonderful things. But this little nude etching here is so beautiful. And if you look here, you can see he signed it, John Sloan over here in pencil, but he also signed it in the etching backwards. This is just a, a glorious piece, but right here in the gallery is a wonderful piece we're going to look at right now, Girl in Kimona. And so Girl in Kimona, that didn't have kimonos in New York City back alleys. They, it's influenced from Japan, and John Sloan never really went to Japan. His ultimate travel was spending summers in uh, New Mexico. But if we look at the, uh, if we look at this etching, it, they were supposed to be 100, but he stopped printing at, I think, 43. And this is number 13 of 43. Look at it. It's just a, a one lovely little piece that shows how the influence of travel continued on, even for people who didn't, didn't uh, travel internationally. They, and one good thing about John Sloan, one great thing, he was a great teacher. He spent a lot of time teaching at the Art Students League was even the director there. He got in a huge fight with him because he wanted to hire uh, George Gross so George Gross would be able to get out of Germany. And they uh, it didn't end well, but he did the right thing. I'm very proud of him. He, he's uh, 
He was a, a great leader in the art world. And here's a chance to see this piece and maybe even put it in your collection. Hi, can we talk about one of my, or one or two of my paintings for just a minute here? Whistler used bridges as symbols, just as we saw the little Putney Bridge, and it just made you feel good. It, it moves things across. This painting of mine, which was inspired in Spain, I was, did it on, mostly on location in, in a little town called Besalu. And this bridge takes you across from one part of the culture to another. There's still a simplicity of the shapes. I love how these shadow shapes are all follow both just the love of the celebration of the shape and also the, the chiaroscuro. Very close in here, right here, you can see that little soft hat. And I have my wife in there. I very often put her in paintings too, just as a, as a little symbol of, of humanity and a few friends over here too. So anyway, the, the, I also love playing the free washes against some textural areas within the painting. Another painting of mine that's here at Lois Wagner's is called uh, uh, Nasum Dorma. And just as Whistler painted bridges in, and also made reference to music, this makes reference to the great aria from the turn on. And uh, there's a, uh, the, the piece has been celebrated all over the, this museum in Fort Smith, Arkansas, the Regional Art Museum there, put, hung it on the side of their building, as you can see. And, uh, and the, the original painting from, from, the, uh, from my hotel in Rome is right here at Lois's. And it's, uh, it's a fun piece to see and, and understand that, the, that Whistler's inspiration, even after, well after 100 years, continues on in my work and, and, and in others. So anyway, if you have a chance, or make a chance, make a, a, a grand vo uh, voyage and a uh, uh, treat for yourself to meet Lois, spend some time in the gallery, and enjoy the multiple, multiple way, uh, way, pieces of art that she has that celebrate American art. Thank you. Until next time, I'm Timothy Clark, Lois Wagner's Be Healthy in Art. Bye.